organization within the organization uh, with the goal of raising awareness and involving the public in some of what we do. So we have lectures like this so you can learn about what we do in our restoration and research efforts. We also have an internship program. Five of my interns are here today. So thank you for their help. Um, Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming, showing interest in this topic, and supporting uh, all the work we do. Uh, again, my name is Harrison Toby. I'm now the current lead researcher for the Bay Scallop Restoration Program. The founder is here as well, Dr. Tettelback, right here. He's the one who started it. So all of this work is more or less a continuation of what he started. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about CCE's Bay Scallop uh, Restoration Program. Uh, we're going to be going over a little bit of the history of it, uh, basically our day-to-day -day operations, some of our current and past um, field data, and then some of our current research that we're doing now. So the closer the scallops are to each other, the more successful their cross-fertilization will be. So these nets, not only do they provide protection from predation, but they also ensure that these scallops out there are close to each other, helping enhance fertilization and successful recruitment. And when they're out there, they're spawning and they're producing larval scallops, those scallops settle, and it helps with local recruitment. Also the juvenile scallops we plant in the first year also help with that recruitment as well. And yep, we plant about 700,000 annually, uh, again, about eight to 16 months in age. Once they've finished spawning, we also plant those adults for you know, commercial baim in the go catch or recreational baim in the go catch. I can't disclose the areas, but we plant them in the Peconic, eastern Peconic areas. Um, and if you do the numbers, since the initiation of this program in 2005, we've planted over 10 million scallops. So another big portion of this, this is where I come in, uh, we also do base scallop population monitoring. Uh, this is done, we call them our benthic dive surveys. We do them via scuba. And what we do is we swim down. I actually left my transect wheel in the car, but just imagine a big measuring tape. So you dive down, you swim out with your measuring tape, you loop back around, and you it's 50 meters. So you swim out 50 meters and you collect everything a meter from that transect wheel as you go back. So you have a 50 by one meter area. So that allows us to estimate scallop population densities because we know the area that we've taken them from. Uh, we look for juvenile and adult base scallops. We also document bottom type and characteristics. This information over time can be important if we see scallops disappear from somewhere, but the bottom type has changed. You know, we can kind of make an inference from that. And then we also document predator type and prevalence. So this is a knob whelk. I'm sure a lot of you have seen them before. We also document um, spider crabs, large claw hermit crabs, uh, as well as channeled whelk, but they're a little bit uh, more sparse than the knob whelks. Um, we do these surveys, uh, two different types. Well, they're the same. They're, both, they're all benthic surveys, but the timings are a little different. We do biannual surveys. So these occur in May and June, and then we do fall surveys that occur in October. This allows us to have an idea of what we're looking at for the potential spawning population in the spring, and then the potential harvestable population in the fall, and then we can also document changes over the summer months 
And this becomes really important when we get to the mass die-offs. And then we also do monthly surveys, which help us narrow down when are these scallops disappearing. Uh, so it allows us to track those changes monthly. So now that we've talked about how we get this field data, we're going to start to look at it. So this will be recent and current field observations. So in light of talking about the mass die-offs and the success of this program, what we're looking at here, the gray bars represent our fall population surveys. So that is mean base scallop density per square meter of adults. And then the black line represents commercial landings. So yes, sir, you know, we see that our survey data shows pretty good populations. You see some fluctuation in our population data, some fluctuation in the uh, commercial landings. But what I really want you to focus on is right here. 2019 was the first mass die-off year, and it's still continuing, and we're still seeing very, very low survey data and very, very low commercial landings. So now we're just going to look at some images that show changes in adult scallop density between our spring surveys and our fall surveys. And unfortunately, this is all not very happy stuff to look at because we're going to look at 2019 through last fall, and these are the mass die-off years. So in 2019, which was the first mass die-off year, we have a couple sites couple areas that had 100% decline in adult scholar populations, and then a lot of them were over 90. This is Red Cedar Point. That one only had a 65% decline, but still pretty significant. 2020, it gets even worse. We're seeing 100% decline in many, many locations. Similar story here, a little bit of uh, variation, maybe a couple scallops were found in some areas, but still not great. 2022. We only had one, we had two sites that we found scallops at in our fall surveys. Not great. So the implications of this on the commercial landings, here we're looking at total harvest in pounds. Almost, you know, over 110,000 pounds were caught in the year prior to the first mass die-off. Not even 7,000 pounds. We had about 70 pounds in 2020, 2021. That could be an artifact. That was a, you know, the first year of COVID, so maybe that had some impact on uh, commercial harvest. We go up a little bit here, and we're right back down to under 7,000 pounds, right around 6,000 in 2022, 2023. All right, so we've seen the doom and gloom, all the negative aspects. The die-offs are a major concern. We didn't really have a good grasp on what was causing them. We knew that there was a parasite. We knew that water temperature played a role, low DO played a role. But now we've got a much better understanding of what's going on. And understanding what's going on allows us to find solutions. So let's look at what is causing this. Uh, so my colleagues, uh, Dr. Boss Malam and Dr. Emmanuel Pales Espinosa, they work over at the Marine Animal Disease Laboratory over at SUNY Stony Brook. And they are phenomenal scientists. They're my biggest colleagues. They do what I can't do, and I do what they can't do. Um, so in 2019, the first year of the mass die-off, Dr. Tettelbach and Scott Hughes sent samples to Boss Malam to see if there was some sort of parasite at play. Um, and they noticed that there were new cells within the tissue samples they were looking at. So they started to investigate it further. Uh, in 2019, they've now gen gene, uh, gene sequenced it, so they have now realized that it is a new, newly discovered parasite. It might have been here prior to 2019, but viruses, parasites, single-celled organisms, they can uh, evolve very quickly, so the virulence, virulence of it might have evolved. So just because we noticed it in 2019 doesn't mean it wasn't here prior. So that's just one thing that's important to note. Uh, however, it infects all the tissue of its host organism. Uh, it infects the mantle, the adductor muscle, the gonads, the stomach, uh, but it is most detrimental in the kidney tissue. And Dr. Alam, we had a meeting with him a couple, about a month ago, and he showed this slide where I believe it was like 60 or 70% of the cells in the kidney tissue 
were not scallop cells. They were the protozoan microparasite that we now call base scallop microsporidia. And then down here we have data from 2021, and this is data we sent to Dr. Alam. And as you can see, we're looking at intensity. It's a scale from zero to three. It's a log scale though. So when you, when you go from zero to one, it's a massive increase. Zero to three, huge. So as we're looking at it, it starts to show up right around May, gets really intense in the summer months, and then starts to go down as water temperatures go down. So that brings us to the next player in the mass die-offs. So uh, Emmanuel, she calls this uh, a perfect storm because all of this is happening at once. So we have the parasite. We have elevated water temperatures in the summer months now above normal. That's causing stress, heat stress, as well as as water temperature goes up, its ability to hold oxygen goes down. So low oxygen, high water temperature, a parasite, and they also spawn in that second year in the early or late spring, early summer. And when they go to spawn, they reallocate energy away from survival and towards reproduction. So if they're allocating energy away from just basic life functions, they're getting attacked by a parasite, there's elevated water temperature stress, low DO stress. They're not really capable of com combating all these stressors. And, oh, wrong arrow. And I was mentioning our monthly surveys. So this is important for tracking when the die-offs are occurring. We're, we saw those numbers, 100% decline, 100% decline. That tells us that they're dying at some point, but it doesn't really tell us when. These monthly surveys give us a much better idea of when the die-offs are occurring. Surprise, they're occurring over those summer months. Uh, this is our field site over at the Orion Harbor Causeway. And as you can see, by August, almost 100% decline in the base scala populations at that field site. So we kind of have a good understanding now of what's driving these mass die-offs. Now that we know, we can start looking for solutions, and that's what we're doing. Um, it's going to take multiple approaches, and we have multiple projects underway now to kind of figure out how can we solve this problem now that we have a better idea of what's causing it. Because you can't really solve a problem if you don't know what the cause is. So we have two projects underway right now in addition to our surveys and all of our aquaculturing of scallops and planting. Um, so we have a fall spawn versus summer spawn scala project, and when this presentation is over, we actually have some of our um, scallops from those spawns in here that we actually also have out in the field. Um, and that project started last year and will run through October of this year. Uh, and then the one that I think is going to be a massive player in this is our restorative breeding program. And again, this involves. Uh, Dr. Alam over at the Marine Animal Disease Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Alam, he's able to do all of the parasitology work, all the genetic work, but he has, doesn't have the capability to do the field work. So it's a perfect synergistic relationship. Dr. Alam likes to say that one plus one is greater than two, basically saying that if he and one of his other colleagues tried to do what I do, it wouldn't quite amount to what our relationship equals. So I do what he can't, he does what I can't, and it's perfect. He's also awesome to work with. So we already looked at this graph. We were looking at, um, I was showing you the summer spawn. I'm going to get a little bit more in detail as to what's represented here. So unfortunately, this axis isn't labeled, but that's the gonadal indices. So we obtain gonadal indices by removing the gonads from the scallop. We shuck the scallop, and then we measure uh, the dry weight of the meat and the dry weight of the gonads, and we can get a comparative analysis as to how reproductively active those scallops are. So basically what you want to look at are these peaks and the valleys. So as they get up towards the top, that means they're getting ready to spawn. When they drop, that means they've spawned out. So this is the typical spawning time. This is a little later than usual, but um, that's kind of like that early summer, late spring spawn. But they can also spawn a second time. And this is known as the fall spawn because it occurs in the fall. Um, so last year, our sites showed a potential fall spawn in the month of September. Uh, here we have an image 
So this is your typical spring summer spawn scallop. And uh, think of like a tree. When you get a cross section of a tree in a temperate area, my dad's a forester, so I, I like making this analysis. Uh, trees will get annual growth rings representing each winter. Scallops do the same thing. So this would be the annual growth ring on a spring or summer spawn scallop, probably around 45 to 50 millimeters. A fall spawn scallop, we call them nubs. And the reason we call them nubs is because their growth ring is typically about 5 to 15 millimeters. And the reason it's smaller is because they have a shorter growing period prior to that first winter. However, if majority of our scallops are dying in the summer, we could lose the fall spawn. And we could lose any potential population dynamic benefits that come with it. An example of potential importance uh, can be seen the two years prior to the mass die-offs. So at multiple locations, this is prior to, to my joining the force, so this is uh, Steve's observational data. Thank you for providing it. Um, we did see, so we, in, the, in those other graphs, we saw all the red numbers representing decreases. In these two years, 2017 and 2018, we actually saw an increase in adult scallop densities. This might sound confusing, but if you're looking for a 50 millimeter scallop and there are five or three millimeter scallops, you might not see those smaller ones and you might only see the bigger ones. So the hypothesis here is why we saw increases as high as 943% in 2017, 958% in 2018, is likely because this increase was a result of very, very robust fall spawns in the years prior to those, to those, and that's likely why we're seeing that increase. So a large representation there would be fall spawn scallops. So they might play an important role, and we might be losing that role, so we want to get a better understanding of that role, but also in light of the parasite, we also want to understand are there benefits to a fall spawn when looking at infection. So right now we have a comparative field study going on. Um, this is going to be a pretty similar thing to what we're, it's identical to what we're doing with the, uh, with the restorative breeding project. So in April of this year, I went to three different locations. Uh, put in via scuba a whole bunch of these screw anchors. One of them I put in 33 of these. So you dive down, you take a piece of rebar, and you work them in. And then, in May, we went out to our long lines where these scallops were housed. We took uh, subsamples of them. We put them in these ADPI bags. They have a carabiner clip when they're in the field, and we clip them onto these screw anchors. So what this allows us to do is because the scallops are in that gear, in that bag, they're not going anywhere. We also limit predation. So this really helps us get an understanding of their survival over time because if they're not going anywhere, we, can, we know the number that's in there, we can count the number of dead, count the number of alive, and get our survival rates. Um, so I do that bi-weekly. I'll go to our survey site, or not our survey sites, our field sites, We'll do the survival data. I also am documenting uh, reproductive data as well to see if there's differences in their reproductive cycles. But what's more important right now is survival. Uh, and then once a month, I'll send subsamples out to Dr. Alam to do parasite intensity data on as well, or analysis, sorry. And back to the parasite. So one of the benefits we're interested in looking at of fall spawning um, is do they have reduced parasite intensity? And the reason we're kind of hypothesizing this is that that parasite is most intense in the summer months. So if you're born in May, your window of exposure to this parasite is much larger than if you're born in September or October. You might not even, they might not even be exposed to the parasite going into that first winter. So that could be in a, a pretty big benefit. They might have higher uh, fitness going into that first winter, and then higher fitness comes spring. So higher survival, potentially. Uh, and that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase survival through the summer so we get a commercial harvest. Uh, right now, the scallops are spawning. Uh, they're staying alive as a species, but they're just not surviving to commercial harvest. And we saw. 110,000 pounds harvested down to 6,000 pounds, and 
there's the dockside value, there's the restaurant value. So scallops are extremely economically important to our communities here in Long Island. So that's a very important aspect is to increase that survival to commercial harvest season. So, and now we'll move on to the restorative breeding. Uh, this one gets a little complicated because we're talking about genetics, which are not my forte, but I'll do my best. Uh, so the idea behind this project is to use genetics and parasitology for restoration. Uh, right now we're trying to identify genetically unique Long Island populations. Dr. Alam sent out almost a thousand scallop samples to go out for genomic sequencing. So we're trying to really figure out the genetic structure of scallops in this area because we want to preserve that. We don't want to take scallops from somewhere else and try to use their genetics to boost their populations. In addition to that, we're trying to identify genetics that promote increased survival. So this is data from 2021. Uh, this is where it gets even a little confusing for me, but I think you know, maybe I'll be able to explain it. Um, each color represents a different sampling period. So we sample once a month. We send them to Dr. Alam. He does genetics and parasitology. Here we're looking at genetics. And more specifically, we're looking at the dominant genes within those samples. So purple was time zero. So that's the dominant genes at time zero. These are the dominant genes at time four, or October. And what's happening here is we're having mortality in this population. And mind you, these all came from the same parents. They're all from the same cohort, meaning they're all the same offspring. Uh, but there is genetic variation within offspring. And that's what we're seeing here. So the scallops that had these dominant genes presumably have died off. And then these genes represent the survivors. And these are the genes we want to look for because those genes might be genes that help promote resilience to the parasite and resilience to elevated water temperature. So that's what we're trying to do, but we're trying to do it much more robustly. So that's why we have, um, I'll move on to the next slide because that goes into the, um, kind of what we're doing now. Uh, I talked about how Steve and I went and collected adult scallops for brood stock. We did that at multiple locations. We tried to do it in areas of high mortality, which made it even harder to find them. But that's, what, that's why we're doing it, because we want to find these survivors uh, that presumably survive the mass die-off because of their genetics. Now again, those genetics are still out. Genomic sequencing takes a long time, so we don't have that data yet. But it could be very, very important. Uh, Dr. Alam also did heat shock experiments with some of the groups we have in the field right now as well. And what he did is he subjected them to very elevated water temperatures. And now we've taken those survivors and deployed them in the field as well. So we have right now five different groups, all from different treatments and different spawns. And we're looking at differences in the genetic makeup, differences in the parasite intensity, and differences in survival. And again, we're hoping they survive because of genetics and not just luck. So this spring, I went out to multiple field sites. We set up three different field sites, one in Flanders, one in Northwest Harbor, and one in Orient Harbor. And what we do is every month we go out, we get a subsample from all these different groups, send them off to Dr. Alam. He does the parasitology and genetic work. Uh, right now, uh, so again, yeah, we're tracking parasite progression and survival. Uh, right now, we don't have the very robust uh, parasitology or uh, parasite intensity information yet, but Bossom is able to do a more simplistic approach where he looks at just the number of parasite cells in comparison to the number of scallop cells, and this allows us to get a bit more, just a quick rough estimation, but because we've now genomically sequenced the parasite and we know what its genetic makeup, we can do a much more robust PCR sampling method that gives us a much better estimation. Right now the results are preliminary and I can't really get too much in the detail on what we're seeing, but we are seeing differences in survival already. We're seeing differences in parasite intensity. So this is a very hopeful thing. So to kind of wrap it up, our CCE's base scallop restoration program was massively successful in restoring the wild populations and commercial harvest 2019 onwards, we've been seeing these mass die-offs. They're occurring mid-summer, likely due to the parasite in conjunction with environmental stressors, again, such as elevated water temperature and low DO. So where do we go from there? Again, we've got a better understanding of the problem. Let's start developing solutions. 
and those solutions will hopefully give us results so we can start making research-backed adaptive management strategies. Just a fancy way of saying we're taking research and we're using that to um, inform us on how to better adapt how we're doing our restoration processes. Uh, the fall spawns, again, decreased window of parasite exposure in year one. That could be a viable option, but I think our best bet will be the restorative breeding. So again, we're not, we're not creating GMOs. We're not trying to manipulate the genome. We're taking scallops from Long Island that are native here, and we're just trying to speed up evolution. Because over time, they might slowly select for these genes and slowly come back. But we're humans. We don't want to wait. So let's try to speed it up. And also, one, another thing to know is this isn't the first time we've done this with shellfish. We've done it with oysters and clams, with MSX and Dermo through genetic selection to get the ones that are able to be resilient towards those diseases. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, we're just trying to make a different one. And I really do think that that restorative breeding is going to be uh, very, very informative and hopefully will be, I hate to say hopefully, but hopefully it'll be the answer because it doesn't seem like they're coming back anytime soon naturally. So on that note, I would like to thank my volunteers uh, from Cornell, uh, my employees, as well as my coworkers. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, Peconic Estuary Partnership, uh, NRAC, NSF, the More Charitable Foundation. They're funding the uh, Fall Spawn Project. Uh, New York State helped with some of the funding. Uh, Suffolk County, uh, they're the backbone of this program. Uh, they provide the funding for all the restoration efforts. Uh, the further research efforts are why we have to go and we have to apply for uh, educational grants through NOAA and through the state. And that's how we get the other uh, projects funded, such as the restorative breeding, fall spawn. So um, you know, I'd like to thank them as well. But last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues over at Stony Brook. Again, Dr. Emmanuel and our Dr. Emmanuel Pales Espinosa and Boss Milan, they're amazing people and they do amazing work and none of this would be possible, all the genetic and parasitology stuff without them. So they're not here, obviously, but I'd still like to thank them. And now I will take any questions.